message today is what what we should be fervent about. And you know, and it's based right there. If you go to Romans uh, twelve, uh, Romans twelve verse eleven, it says, "Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing in instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality." And the Bible actually speaks a couple of times on what you know what you need to be fervent about. And fervent is just you know. Uh, Definitions that you can get, or that it's causing a boil or heat up, but it's also just being real zealous and on fire for something. You know, you're excited about it. This is something that you're really into. And there's a couple of things us as Christians that we have to be fervent about. And the first thing that I, that I want to point out is if you'll turn to Acts uh, 18, just go a few pages back to the Book of Acts, uh, chapter 18 and verse 24. Acts 18 and verse 24. And the first thing I want to point out is. But the Bible tells us to be fervent in spirit. You know, we have to be fervent in spirit. We already read that uh, verse right there. It says, not slothful in business. And when it talks there about business, not just talking about like how we know in the world business. It, it means in business, whatever that, whatever we're focused on. You know, business is just doing things and getting the job done. It's not being a busybody. It's if you're going to work on a task, you know, work on it. Create a result, do it as quickly and as efficiently as possible, and then move on to the next thing. Well, as Christians, what are we supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to lead others to Christ. So our business is, you know, the spreading of the gospel, the preaching of the word. And it says fervent in spirit. Well, that spirit that we are fervent in is the Holy Spirit, right? Let's look at uh, Acts 18 and verse 24, and it, it, it's going to tell us another way to be fervent in spirit. And it says, and certain Jew named Apollos born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in, in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass to Achaia, Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come helped them much, which he had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So, so a couple of things we see here is that Apollos is a Jew who's fervent in spirit. He's learned and, and he's an eloquent speaker. But if you notice... Achilles and Priscilla notice that he's he's excited, he's on fire for the Lord, but he doesn't know as much as he needs to know. And they kind of give him, they expound the word, they perfect his doctrine, and then he goes out and he said, and then they send him out and they say, look, receive him because he's he's fervent in spirit for the Lord. And what does he do? He says, for he mightily convinced the Lord. That's verse 28. Uh, I mean, for he mightily convinced the Jews. And that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So not only immediately, the first thing we see is that he, he knew of the baptism of John. And see, this is what happens sometimes. You know, when I was a Seventh-day Adventist, I knew the scripture, or I knew some of the scripture, right? But I wasn't saved, and I didn't understand the grace of Christ, and I didn't understand salvation by grace. I understood it by works. And, you know, you have to go to church on Sabbath, and we have to do certain things. And so there's a lot of things that if you look at my life, compared to a Christian saved by grace, you could have said, well, maybe some things I did better, some things they did better, but there wasn't a lot of difference in the way we walk. You know, I didn't go out and, you know, we didn't, the Seventh-day Adventists don't drink alcohol, and actually they don't even eat pork, or sure. they follow some of the Sabbatical laws, right? But the thing that they didn't focus on was preaching the Word of God. You know, you ever go to a, a sermon, one of the things that really stood out to me when I first got saved was how much the gospel was preached. You know, how much the reminder that there's a hell and that if you don't accept Jesus Christ, you will be in that hell. You know, growing up Seventh-day Adventist, there was a lot of good sermons preached from the Bible, but it's always truth with lie. And that's the problem, right? If you don't feel lost, how are you going to be found through Jesus Christ? And so Apollos here, he's fervent, but what they do is they clear up his doctrine. And then at the end, what is he doing? He's showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. In other words, at first it was not only the baptism of John, but eventually all he was preaching was Jesus Christ. Well, that's all we ever do is preach Jesus Christ. Through all our messages is what do, what do people know about us? 
what do people know about the Baptist religion that we're saved by grace, right? That we follow the doctrines of the Bible, that we don't tend to, to uh, twist scripture. Now, man does. We sometimes make mistakes, but for the most part, if you follow Baptist history, they're following biblical principles. Just like everything, there's always rotten apples in a, in a pile. I mean, you can't control everybody, but if you look overall, the Baptist doctrine is salvation by grace through Jesus Christ. Well, how do you do that? You know, you're fervent in the spirit. When you first get saved, I remember when I got saved at the age of 25, the very first thing I wanted to do was tell others that I got saved. You know, there's nothing greater than having that eternal security that you're no longer going to have. That's that fervent spirit to go out there and do the work of the Lord. And we should be on fire for the Lord. We should work hard for the Lord. And we should be zealous and we should be ready. And people take that wrong sometimes. You know, when you're preaching the word, it's everything. And sometimes some of the stuff that we preach isn't always politically correct and can be highly offensive to those who don't believe in God's word and who hate God. But you know what? We have to be fervent in the truth regardless of what the consequences are to us. I mean, if you see this, Apollos, he's excited, and then he not only improves his doctrine, but he gets tougher on his doctrine. You think about, this is a time where, uh, shortly after Jesus' death, and what were the Jews trying to do? They were trying to discredit the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were going out there and paying people to lie that Jesus' body was stolen. You know, I mean, you see this in the scriptures, and what is he saying? He says, Showing them, I mean, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So the first thing we have to do is be fervent in spirit. You know, the second thing that the Bible speaks us when, when it says, what should we be fervent about? Is fervent, we should have a fervent mind. You know, and, I, and I'm going to drink plenty of water because that word fervent, it, it's a real tongue twister, but we're going to stick to it because that's what the Bible uses. For a... Uh, to expound on the word, but if you go to 2 Corinthians, verse 7, and then so you've got Acts, Romans, you know, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, and you go to chapter 7, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, and we're going to go down to verse 7, verse 1 through 7 of 2 Corinthians, chapter 7. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1 says, Having therefore the promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before you that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glory of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God comforted those that are cast down, comforted, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and now by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told you, told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind towards me. So that I rejoice the more. And when he's, I guess the, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that with the fervent mind is the Bible tells us that we have to bring certain things into to subjection, right? The, Bible, the body is the temple of Christ. And there's certain things that we have to take control of. Even though God is all powerful and he's all knowing, he's given us free will. So we have the choice of where we want to take our thoughts. We can be fervent towards others and towards the ministry, or we can just let them uh, go off and you know, think bad thoughts or get distracted by the things of this world or let the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes dominate. But the Bible tells us to be fervent in the mind. Let's go back to that verse. It says, and not only by his coming, I mean, and not, verse seven, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire your mourning, your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoice the more. So he's going through this, this is Paul speaking, and he's talking about how he was boldness of speech, and he's kind of letting them know what's going on and how they were they were struggling with things. But what he's reminded us how they had a fervent mind towards them. And what a fervent mind means is that you're thinking on the things of God and you're thinking on the people of God. Let's go back to Romans. And you don't have to turn there because we can go, actually, if you want to go to James, because we're going to go back to Romans, just the first three verses. Go to James 5 for the next uh, point. But if you go to Romans 12, 
verse 1, as we read earlier, says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Well, if you're thinking, if you're fervent towards the birth of Christ, if you're fervent to the lost, in spirit and in mind, well, you're not thinking of yourself more highly, right? And you're conforming your body, and you're, you're, uh, you're being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, how do you renew your mind? It's, I always like, liken it to like a membership, right? You know, uh, we have a Costco membership, my wife and I. We, we buy things at Costco and Vault just so we don't have to go grocery shopping all the time. And one of the things you gotta do is every year you gotta renew. What does that mean? That it's giving you a, a new membership so you have the privilege to have that access. Well, with God, what's, how do we renew that membership? You know, we're not renewing our salvation. Now, let me make a distinction. Salvation is by grace. It's free. Once saved, always saved. But if we want to work on the ministry, if we want to be fervent in spirit, if we want to be fervent in our minds, we have to renew them day and night in the scripture. This is our membership. You know, every time we close it, we close that membership. Every time we open it, we're back in the Word of God. And then there's other ways to maintain that, right? To renew that spirit. It's not just learning and reading the Word of God. It's also having that spirit. But then the next point is that if you go to James 5, James 5, uh, James chapter 5, verse uh, 13. We're going to go 13 through 19. James uh, chapter 5, verses 13 through 19. And it's talking about being fervent in prayer. See, so we have a zealous or a fire for Christ and for the Lord and for His work in our spirit. And then we have that fire in our mind. We, we, we're constantly working. And you know, you ever meet those people who are constantly thinking of the next project? You can see them think. You ever meet that person? You say, man, I can see them thinking. But what are they thinking about? Is it, you know, money? Is it the next football game? Is it the next retirement plan? Is it the next 10 years? Or is it the next goals for Christ? You know, the people that we surround ourselves with, the people, the reason that you know, I'm a member of this church. The reason that I follow Pastor Cobb is because he's on fire for Christ. He's fervent in his mind for Christ. But let's go to James 5, uh, verse 13. It says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any married? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was, subject, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And so we see here that the effectual fervent prayer, and let's read that correctly so we don't get that messed up, but in verse 16, it says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so it's not just prayer. You know, you ever do those, especially, I mean, probably the, 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 the time when you pray the most, I guess, nonchalant, or and we should pray fervently all the time, right? The Bible says pray without ceasing, but probably when you eat eating lunch, or you're about to eat dinner, or you're about to bless a meal, right? Dear Lord, bless this food, thank you for the Lord, something along those lines, and then you move on. But the Bible wants us to, if we're, in order for our prayer to be effective and to avail much, it has to be a fervent, effectual prayer, right? It's, and then it, it gives us an example of Elias. And it says, look, Elias, because people, you know, Elijah, Elias, or in this case, Elijah, he was a, a great prophet of Christ, right? He was a great prophet in the Old Testament. But the Bible is very clear and it's reminding us, look, he was a man just like you and me, but he prayed fervently and it didn't rain for a space of three years. What did it say? Uh, verse 17, for three years and six months. It didn't rain for three years and six months. And what God's telling us here is, look, we can have that same power in our prayer. You know, sometimes I think we, we downplay our prayer life because we are so used to, especially 
in this country where our culture is, you know, you do and you get a result and then you get praise and everybody notices, right? I mean, what's the, what was the slogan of President Trump, make America great again? Look how great we are, look how we're number one. But, and so the challenge is sometimes as Christians, we, we just wanna go out there, we wanna get the hooray for the, the soul winning or we want to get the hooray for people that got baptized, or how many people showed up to church, or how good we clean the church, or whatever it is. But the reality is that you know God wants us to pray hard too. It's not just knocking on those doors, but how are you preparing to knock those doors, or to talk to others about Christ, right? I mean, how are you, I mean, some of the best results that we've gotten soul winning is actually my soul winning partner. You know, he'll be talking to someone, and God willing, I hope, Based on the Bible, I think it's true that if I pray while he's so winning, that there's an effectual, fervent prayer. And I'm not saying that every time I have, I'm in that spirit. You know, we've got to be in the right frame of mind. And I'm not taking away from the person that's leading those from to Christ because I don't know what kind of prayer life they did. Maybe we both prayed great before, and so we got great results, or we just planted those seeds. But the thing that we need to focus on is that our prayer life has to be fervent. We have to be on fire for Christ in our spirit. We have to be on fire for Christ in our mind. We have to be on fire for Christ when we pray. It shouldn't just be this, you know, lazy days and cold uh, prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for this food. Thank you for everything. Amen. No, what are we praying for? Lord, there's loss. There's people going to hell. Help me, lead me to the right tools. Give me the resources. Give me the, the, the words. Give me the learning and understanding so that we can lead others to Christ. You know, I love preaching on the non-political correct uh, sermons, but and those are great for teaching and growing and discipling. I think we need more people to learn the Bible correctly, that, but there's nothing like leading a soul to Christ, right? Someone who's lost and you knew, once they got saved, you knew that moments before they were headed to hell for an eternity, and now that's taken care of. That's a foot. But, how do we do that? We do that in our spirit, we do that in our mind, and we do that in our prayer. And let's go to Colossians 4. Colossians 4. Colossians 4. Just to back this point up and just give you a good example of uh, you go to Colossians 4, verses 12 and 13. And the Bible gives us a good example here, and this is Paul speaking, and he's kind of uh, talking to everybody and, and pointing out different leaders that he worked with and their attributes. And in verse uh, 12, he says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayer, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and them that are in La 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 Laodicea, and them in Caralopis. And excuse me if I butchered those, you know, sometimes, uh, especially with the fervent tongue twisting, we might get them wrong, but the point there is not that I, whether I got those cor uh, pronunciations correct, the point there is that Epaphras was laboring fervently for others in his prayer. You know, and I just read not to think of ourselves more highly in Romans 12, 1 through 3, right? That we're renewing ourselves, that we're transforming our mind, that we're conforming not to this world. And what? It, how do you do that? You do that by praying for others. And Paul actually recognizes that. So this guy is not, he's not out there, he's not the, I don't know if he's a great preacher or not. But, but Paul doesn't point him out for being a great student of the word or memorizing scripture or for you know leading many to Christ or for being a great speaker. He's saying, look, I'm recognizing him for his prayer, for his prayer life. And you've heard of those prayer warriors. And I like to think that sometimes, you know, you're out there in the battle and the reason that you're able to stand, just like it says here, the reason you stand perfect and complete in all the will of God is because others have prayed for you and prayed for me while we're out there doing the things in Christ, right? While we're doing the work for the Lord. So we have to be fervent in prayer. And that means that we better get down on our knees. It better be in private. The Bible is very specific in our closets. And then we better just take time one-on-one -on -one with the Lord and let Him know what's on our hearts. And we should pray for others. We should pray for Pastor Cobb. 
We should pray for the congregation and those in here. And we should pray for others that don't come to this church. Hey, anybody who's preaching the Word of God and who's out there in the battle who's willing to put, put uh, the Word of God first in spite of the consequences, we should pray for them. You know, that's why I mentioned these guys that I follow. You know, if, if Pastor Logan Robertson is in, in being detained, I want to pray for him. You know, because he's doing the work of the Lord and he was able to stand perfect and complete in the will of God because I know many pray for him, right? Because people are fervent for leaders like that because he's fervent and zealous for the Lord. And that's those are the people that we should stand by. The Bible says that we have no fellowship with the world. As a matter of fact, if you're a friend of the world, you're an entity with God, right? You're you're an enemy of God. So we should who should be our friends? Those that believe like we do, that are biblical on their, on, their, on their belief, that believe that salvation is by grace through Jesus Christ, that have their doctrines correct. Look, there's a lot of people that don't agree on every doctrine that I have, but the main doctrine, the one that keeps you out of hell, if that one's right, I'm going to pray for them. And I might not be their best friend, but if they needed, they needed us to stand with them, I would probably stand with them. You know, it depends on the consequence of me. I, or the circumstance, not the consequence, the circumstance of what's going on. The consequence I don't care about. But the circumstance, you know, I mean, obviously, if I have to, if I have to go to Australia, well, we better know, pick the battle correctly. Because that's not what God always wants us to do. But we can pray for people, even if we're not in the battlefield out there in Australia, or in the Philippines, or in the mission field in Mexico, or whatever the case may be. So, what does God want us to be fervent about? He wants us to be fervent in spirit, fervent in mind, fervent in prayer. And then turn to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4, he wants us to be fervent in charity. So go to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter 4. And excuse me. I got a scratchy throat. I woke up with a bit of a... A swell, I guess I'm getting, I'm coming under the weather, but so it's uh, it's affecting my my speech. But independent of that, let's let's get let's get through the message here, right? First Peter four verse one, first Peter four verse one. We're gonna go to verse ten. It says, "For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for that he hath suffered in the flesh, hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time." in the flesh to the lusts of men but to the will of God for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness lust, excess revelings, banquetings and abominable, and abominable uh, idolatries wherein they think it strange that ye run out with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to the men in flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer, and above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And so God wants us to have fervent charity. And I like the King James. You know, a lot of people say that that word is love. And it's true. You know, if you study the word charity means love. But God used the word charity in the King James. So it's more than just the love that we can think of. So let's use the correct term. And the reason I say that is because he's telling us be fervent in charity. Not just love. But that charitable love, the biblical definition of it, you know, and we can go to first, I'm not going to preach on, on charity, but there's there's a lot of verses that will back this up and define, and the Bible will define itself, but right now the point that, that I want to make is that we have to, well, how do we show love for our brothers and sisters in Christ? When should we be fervent in charity? Well, number one, you know, if, we, if we're not thinking of ourselves highly, but number two, I think, and, and let me reverse those, number one, we should go out there and preach to the lost souls, right? How much more can we love someone that we're willing to stand and lose friendships and lose family, but we plant the seed and we preach the word of eternal salvation? You know, I mean, I remember a couple weeks ago, and I've been meaning to say this from up here and I keep forgetting, but a couple weeks ago I knocked on the door over here on uh, Britmore and, and uh, Clay, on uh, one of the neighborhoods we were uh, soul winning, 
And the girl that came out, she was wearing some glasses, and on the side it said Pride 2018. So I'm assuming that she went to the uh, Sodomite Pride you know, parade in June for 2000, that's this year. So she was there sometime this, this year. And I know that it's one of those things where they give away these glasses and all that stuff. And so here I am, you know, I immediately put up, like a, in my mind I thought, well, I'm gonna start preaching and she's gonna just blow me off. Her name was Samantha and I'm like, look, Samantha, if you were to die today, you're 100% sure you'd be going to heaven. She's like, no. I said, well, look, the Bible tells us how you can be sure. And if you've got a couple of minutes, I can show you the Bible, how you can be sure that you're going to heaven. And what's interesting is she let me go take her through the gospel and the best part is she got saved. Now, most people say that we, when we preach against sodomy and we preach against the pedophilia of the world and the queers and all the bad things that they're doing, they say that we're hateful. Well, yeah, I hate them that hate God, the Bible says. But I love the lost souls and I want them to be saved and then I want them to grow in Christ. You know, I don't know what Samantha's life is. I don't know what she's been through. For all we know, that's just all she knew. She might not even be a son of mine. As a matter of fact, let me correct that statement. She got saved, so she's not. But you know what happens in life? Is we surround ourselves with who influences us, right? And so you end up doing stupid things and you end up in situations you shouldn't be because nobody told you to do better, right? Birds of a feather, they flock together. My, my, my parents always got on to me. They wouldn't let me hang out with certain people because you know, they said, if you hang out with those people, you're going to end up just like them. And they know, and they're like, we know you're not doing those bad things, but they are. And so by proxy, you're looked upon like that, right? And how is it, you know, if you get stopped uh, on, a, on a car, I mean, if you get stopped by the police and you're a passenger, and it so happens that the, the driver has drugs on him, guess what? By proxy, you're a drug dealer or a drug trafficker or a drug user, and you get charged. You know, it's called, you know, you're an alibi or, uh, uh, and I don't know the term, you're an accessory to that crime, right? You become part of that. And, then, you know, that girl, for all we know, she's just growing up around that environment. Obviously, if she was open to the Christ, if her spirit accepted Jesus Christ, then that's not where, where she wants her life to go. And you'd be surprised how many people don't believe that, that they just don't know how to stand up to it because the agenda is, to sympathize and to victimize these evil people. And so when anytime you speak against them, then you're the bad guy. When it's really the opposite way, right? You know, every time they come, I mean, I don't want those people around my kids. They're the enemy. Not only the enemy to Christ, but the enemy to us. And so we should be fervent in our charity for others. You know, I'll preach to anybody and I'll plant that seed. Now we know that broad is the way that leads to destruction. So I know that not everybody's gonna get saved, but that's not, God didn't say, go and preach only to the people you think are going to get saved. He said, preach the word, you know, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And let's go to 1 Peter 1, so just a couple of pages uh, to, your, to your left. 1 Peter 1 and verse 22. And it says, in verse 22, it says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So there it is again. God's telling us to love Fervently. Well, how do you get a pure heart? First, you got to be saved, right? But then you got to do the things that God asks you to do to purify that heart, to purge that sin out of your life. You know, the Bible tells us to flee fornication. That's the only way we can avoid temptation, right? That last part of 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says flee fornication. Everybody loves that, the first whole verse, but then they never tell you flee fornication. We'll go there in a second, but let's not uh, get off track here. Verse 23 it says, be born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. See, a pure heart comes from incorruption by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. And so, we've got to have fervent charity for others. You know, we've got to have fervent prayer. And if you notice, all the things that God asks us to do fervently, it's for others. The, the, the false preachers, the false religions, it's all about me. It's all about them. You know, it's all about how much money they can bring in, or how much publicity they can get, or how much good gospel they can preach versus negative gospel. Those that preach the word, we don't care if people notice us or not. What we care is that the job gets done. What's that job? You know, the eternal security of the lost. 
and they become one saved, always saved. But uh, let's go. Let me let me close out with this. Go to Second Peter three one. So just go back. Uh, go go to your right a couple pages. Second Peter chapter three verse one. Now there's one thing that that is the consequence. You see, if we're not fervent, and let me let me rephrase that. If we're not fervent in these things, if we're not fervent in spirit, in mind, you know, in prayer and in charity, if we're not doing this because we only get one. Life is not a rehearsal. There's only we only get this one ch chance to go and the first thing, right, is become knowledgeable of Jesus Christ. Then we get that one chance to accept Him or reject Him. And what I mean by that is I know that some people get multiple, the gospel gets presented to them multiple times, but eventually you, you get to that last chance, which is the one chance, right? You can either accept or reject, and then you become a reprobate. But then the other thing is, once we're saved, we should grow in Christ. Now, the works aren't necessary to get saved, but they are necessary if we want rewards in heaven. And if we want to lead others to Christ, and if we want to lead more souls, and we want to spread the gospel, and the consequence of that is there's one negative fervent in the Bible. And that's in 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 13. And, and it's a negative for those that didn't accept Christ. It's a positive for us, right, that are saved. But the Bible says, This second epistle, beloved, and I, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your, your pure minds by the way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as it were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant. And I love that verse because we have a lot of willingly ignorant people running around today. So this is like exactly what the Bible is talking about. It says, For this they for this they willingly are ignorant of that, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished by the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto first and unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to, to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. So we see here that the, and he's actually telling us that we need to be on fire for Christ. You know, if we, if we read this in its context, he's saying, look, scoffers are coming. They're willingly ignorant. You know, but it says, but beloved, in verse 8, be not ignorant of this one thing that uh, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some may count slackness, but is long suffering to us where it's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. So what he's saying here is, look, he's, he doesn't want anybody to perish. But who does he leave the work to? What's up for us? It's up to us to spread the gospel. But at some point, and we know that eventually this whole book's going to come to conclusion, right? In our lives and in the world history, the world's going to be burned in a fervent heat in order to create the new heavens and the new earth. So if we're not on fire for Christ now, we're, we're still going to get the same consequence. That fervent heat that's going to destroy the world is coming. But it's up to us to decide what we're going to do now on this earth for Christ. And we can be saved and not do anything. You know, I use this verse a lot when I go soul winning. And I use this verse a lot when, we, when, we're, uh, when we're preaching. Uh, you know, I love this, this set of verses. Go to Romans 4 and uh, verse 4 and 5. And getting saved is about the best thing you can do. But living for Christ is even better. 
after you get saved. And what I mean by that is, you know, the Bible tells us very clearly, it says in verse 4 of chapter 4 of Romans, it says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, if you're looking for your work to save you, it's of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And I love that verse because it makes that distinction between those that are saved but don't, don't have any zeal for Christ. Don't have any fire. They just show up to church. They clock in and they clock out. There's no incentives. They're not moving up in the ranks. They're not looking for a promotion. And it makes that distinction between them and those that are saved. But we want those rewards. We want those crowns. And we're looking for that. And the Bible tells us that we can do that if we're fervent in these things. See, I, we all get discouraged. We all get down. The battle's out there and it's big. But God tells us, look, if you're focused on these things, if you're on fire in spirit, if you're on fire in your mind, if you're, and I'm using that because, you know, that's, I'm just being, using synonyms, all right? If you're on fire in prayer and in charity, then you can accomplish more for me before I get the world on fire under a fervent heat. So let's go ahead and just close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the ability to just, and the opportunity to preach your word today. But Lord, help us to be fervent in the things that you've instructed us to be. Lord, to go out there and, and to be fervent in spirit and to control our minds and to make our minds focus and get on fire for you, Lord, and to pray uh, zealously and, and with passion for those that are lost and for our brothers and sisters in Christ in the battle and, and to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, but also to love those that are lost, Lord. Lord and to go out there and knock on each door. And it's, it's amazing because those of us that go out there soul winning, whether it's door knocking or we talk to people on the street, we'll probably preach to more of the people that we know we should hate and we hate for their uh, wickedness and their debauchery and their just flat out hate, hatred for you, Lord. But at least we're planting the seed and others will be affected by it. So Lord, help us to be on fire for you before uh, you're coming and you're and, and your new earth and your new heaven and lord just help us to have a good week help us to close out this week uh on fire for you lord in jesus name we pray amen